Good morning. I want to talk just a bit more about the prayer gathering. We had, we've now, we now, we now have one under our belt. And uh, I had determined, and I'm still determined, I had determined before we, um, before we started our prayer gatherings that we would not over-program our prayer gathering, meaning you wouldn't come to an old school prayer meeting, which is what I used to do every Wednesday night, and there was nothing wrong with it. In fact, it was a blessing. Uh, but I determined that we wouldn't over-program in the sense that we would have an old school prayer meeting where you would come and mostly you would listen to someone talk, you know, or we would, or we would have an open mic and everybody would come up and share their prayer request, which is cool. And we, we may do a little bit of that. But I determined that we were, we're going to over-program it. So if you came on Wednesday night, it was, it was a solemn time. It was a quiet time. It was a time in which we could just silently pray um, in the same room together. Uh, now what we're going to do is we're going to begin um, with, with just a little bit uh, of programming over the next few weeks. Uh, it's going to be, this, this Wednesday night, it's going to be largely just quiet time, just like it was. But what we're going to do is we're going to, talking about how we might program it a bit, we're going to have a, a whiteboard right here. And when you come in, if you have something that you would want other people to pray, pray about. Now, some of the stuff that I pray, prayed about on Wednesday night, I, I don't really want to share with anybody. I just wanted to pray about it. Uh, but if there's something that you would like other people to pray uh, over as well, then when you come in on Wednesday night, this uh, Tuesday night, uh, when you come in on Tuesday night, this, this Tuesday night, you can just come silently, come right up to the whiteboard, and there'll be a marker, and you can just write what you would like someone to pray. You know, make it short, make it brief, so that they can read it, they can see it from out there. And then I'll be sitting here, and Lydia will be sitting there. Many of you came on Wednesday night. You, you, you'll be able to see it, and we will just... We'll commit to silently praying for whatever you put on that board. Um, and the only other thing that we're going to do that's sort of a, a, a programmed thing is, is um, I'm going to be here and Lydia's going to be here, um, and we will pray for you if you would like that. Um, we will, perhaps our other elders will be here, uh, but whoever's here, as far as elders go, we will, we will uh, we'll pray for you, and in fact, I uh, hope this doesn't weird you out, uh, it shouldn't, but we will, if you have some physical need, for instance, and you would like for us to anoint your head with oil, following after the practices of the New Testament, then we just put a little drop of oil on your head, and we pray that, that in Jesus' name you would be healed. And, and so we'll do that uh, if you would like that. You're not obligated to do that, and we don't come looking after you to pour oil on your head, but if you'd like to be uh, prayed for, uh, maybe you don't want to be anointed. You just want to be prayed for, then that's, that's awesome. You can come and, and find... And then you find Lydia, find one of the other elders, and we will pray for you. Um, and so that, it's that s simple. And it goes from 7 to 8, but if you come and you pray for 30 minutes and, and you're done, then you, you leave. It's a kind of a come and, not kind of, it is a come and go prayer gathering. So that's 7 to 8 p.m. The only two things that we're adding this, when, this Tuesday night is the, the prayer board, which you can um, access immediately upon arrival and uh, the opportunity to be prayed over. Now, that is, not, that, is not, uh, that is not meant to imply that you are not allowed to, of course, pray for one another. I mean, you may not want one of the elders, you may want your, your, your friend or, or your, your, your brother or whomever to pray for you that night. That's cool. That's awesome. This space is open for us to pray. The Lord has made a promise that if, if we will seek his face, and we will pray, and we will turn from our wicked ways, that, that, that he'll forgive our sins, that, that he will heal our land. And uh, so I've told you, I have a great deal of expectation regarding how the Lord is going to, to work in and through us in Brownsville over the next 18 months. And so the bulk of my time praying on uh, Tuesday nights, um, this past Tuesday night, was regarding that. And then I prayed for some of you individually, as I know your needs, and I look forward to seeing uh, even more of you this Tuesday night at 7 p.m. Uh, as Daniela said, this is going to go for a season. We don't know exactly when this is going to end. It's going to go for a season. It may go for the next 18 months. Um, who knows what the Lord is going to do? We, we won't know unless and until we gather together in prayer. 
Who knows? Maybe God will do something so big that people will talk about the Tuesday night prayer gathering at River Church long after I'm dead. May it be. May it be. So I in, in, invite you, I encourage you to be here on Tuesday night uh, for our prayer gathering. Well, it's the, it's the summer of love. It's certainly the summer. You know that. The, uh, the heat and the mosquitoes tell you that. But uh, we're in this new series called The Summer of Love. This is week three. Uh, and uh, it's going to be a fairly brief uh, sermon series, uh, as will be the summer itself. I was driving here early this morning, and I was thinking about the rest of the summer, and I was realizing that it's less, I think it's less than four weeks, or maybe four weeks from tomorrow. Um, it's, it's, I believe, August the 16th. Our kids, anyway, go back to, to public school. Uh, and long before that, football practice will begin and probably games will begin. And so we are quickly approaching the end of summer. Uh, and we are quickly approaching a, uh, a new series, uh, a new push, some new endeavors for the fall here at River Church. I'll be telling you more about that. Pastor Billy and Pastor Andre will tell you more about that. A new series, a new gathering, some, some cool stuff that's going to be happening in the fall. But between now and then, I really want us to drill down deep on this study of 1 John, the, the, the epistle, the first epistle of John. Uh, if you've been here one of the last two weeks, you, you've heard a little bit of history. But, but John, he was, he was one of the apostles. He was young. He was impetuous. His, uh, his nickname started out with, uh, he started out with the nickname the Son of Thunder. He and his brother were the Sons of Thunder. Uh, and, and then ultimately, they, he, he, he became known as, uh, for, 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 throughout history now, his, his nickname is um, the one whom Jesus loved. That's like one of the two coolest nicknames uh, in the whole Bible. The other one that I really like, it wasn't really a nickname, uh, but, but it was Moses, when he, when, when, when he was described as the most humble man on the face of the earth. Man, if you can get one of those two titles, like you can be recorded in Scripture as either the most humble man on the face of the earth or the one whom Jesus loved. Man, you're doing something right. So if you want to learn about humility, you'd probably go uh, s- s- learn from uh, the, the, the one who is referred to as the most humble man on the face of the earth, right? If you want to learn about humility, you'd probably go to him. If you want to learn about love, man, you'd go to the source, right? You would go to the, the one whom Jesus loved because John, he could tell you, look, Jesus loved me, and, I can, and therefore I can tell you what pure, unadulterated God love really is. And I can tell you the impact, the effect that it has on a person. Right? And so, so really, that is the, 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 the nature of this first epistle of John, written by that guy, the expert, the one whom Jesus loved. And I think it's probably not um, a surprise to you that, that the church, we talk about love. You've probably heard somewhere that, that, you know, that, that, that the church is supposed to be about love. It's supposed to be a, a, a place of love. You know, 1 John chapter 4, which we'll be studying a few weeks from now, we have that famous passage which says, God is love. Um, and, and so we, we, we know, even people out on the street that don't go to church, they know that yeah, the church is supposed to be about love. And then there's this pause, and then there's... And yet, because I've talked to a, a number of you who have a painful story. We, we've had these sort of painful conversations regarding the hatred that you maybe experienced in church, the judgment that you have received at some point in your story as a person who's attended church. I've talked to some of you who were out of the church for decades because of that fact, and, and now you're giving it a try again. And so with that in mind, we're, we're studying First John, a tiny little book. It's tucked way in the back of the Bible, almost 
at the end. Thursday evening, um, I, was, I was out on the island. Um, I, was at a, I, was at a, a, I was at this gathering, a conservation organization, but I was at a, at a, a social gathering at this place I hadn't been there before. It was kind of a nice place overhanging the bay. It's called, it's called the Tequila Sunset Bar and Grill. And so I was there, it's this conservation meeting, so you know that I, on the side, I'm a, I'm a fly fishing guide, and so, like, there were some really well-known, um, some heavy hitters in, the, in, that, in that arena were there, and I know them, and I've been doing this for a long time, and so have they, and so it was, it was sort of a mixer, it was, uh, it had a purpose, but, but it, was, it was cool just being around guys that I get to see on the water from time to time, and I've known for 15 years as a guide, as a guide. and so uh, I, I love those guys, I love fishermen, uh, I love to point out the fact that, that Jesus' apostles, uh, the majority of them, were, were Galilean fishermen. And so I think it's cool that when I hang around fishermen and I find them so appealing because Jesus himself, that's the culture that he grew up in. Um, so I was having this conversation with, one, with, with a local, a guy that I've known for a long, long time, and he told me of the pain of a sinful choice that he made 10 years ago. And I was around the whole scenario. I remember when it happened. I know what he's talking about. And he, he told me, he said, Randy, he said, Randy, I believe this. He said, Randy, one day God is going to use that sin that broke me He's going he's to use my story so that I can help someone else going through what I was going through. Now, when I tell you stories like that, you're like, ah, fishermen don't talk that way. But I'm telling you, when I'm on the, when I'm on the boat with, with guys from all over the country or guides, they, talk, they bring it up. They talk to me about spiritual stuff. They want to talk about Jesus because they know like I'm some kind of a spiritual guru. And so they feel safe because I'm also a fisherman. They feel safe because I'm also a fisherman. So he said that to me. Like God, he said, I know, I really do believe that one day God's going to use the junk in my past, my story, so that I can help someone else going through what I was going through. And I said, man, I really told him, I said, man, we need guys like you at River Church. I told him about River Church and invited him, and he'll probably be here in the next few weeks. I, I, I think so. I'm praying that he will be. Um, now, now, look, the church, I, I want to make this clear, the church it has it was never meant to be a place where we like give each other license to sin. We're like I love you, and you can do whatever you want. And th that's not my point in preaching this this sermon series. That we're supposed to be just accepting in a really like shallow way. It, it's never been a place, the church, where we just give each other license to sin, to walk in darkness, as John describes sin in this book. The church is, however, a place where we, can, where we can safely confess our sins. We can safely confess our sins not just to Jesus, but to one another. And we can help one another through our difficulties. And we can admit, we, we can say things like, yeah, me too, man. Like, I'm there. I'm with you. I've been through that. I'm going through that. I'm struggling with sin. And, and I, I don't want to be that way anymore. And let's walk through this together. And I want to walk in the light, as, as John describes. I don't want to walk in darkness anymore. And we just come clean with one another. And we're honest with one another. And, and we need to. If, if, if there's anything you've, you've hopefully learned from the last two weeks of studying this book, we need to, in the church, always be confessing our sins and always be in a posture of repentance. And, 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 and you know what the Lord promises if we do that? You know the result that, that the Lord speaks of in, in John's writing? Twofold, twofold benefit. One is friendship with the Lord. That's a phrase straight out of the Bible. And the, and, and the other is friendship one another, with one another in the church. When we no longer walk in darkness, we, we begin walking in the light. The, the twofold result is friendship with the Lord and friendship with one another 
in the church, the, the Greek word we talked about a couple of weeks ago, kononia, fellowship. Man, I want a church like that. I, I've said this, and I mean for this to, 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 be, to be encouraging. I hope it is. And I, I say this to you, and I, I say it back to me as well. Your greatest problem isn't the fact that you need a Savior. Your greatest problem is the fact that you won't admit that you need a Savior. I mean, Jesus went to the cross precisely because he knew that we were all messed up. We're all screwed up. We're all sinners. He's not surprised by the mess that you've gotten yourself into. He went to the cross to be your Savior precisely because he knows you. He knows me. He knows us. So this week we're going to go a little further. This is a verse-by-verse -verse study of this, of this uh, book, although I, I, I'm, I'm stressing a little bit because I'm going to have to skip part of the book. I haven't decided which part. I'm going to have to skip part of the book because we don't have enough weeks in the summer to cover it all. But we're gonna, for now, we're going to keep going without skipping a verse so far. And so here's what we're talking about this week, and that is the role of Jesus in our lives uh, as our advocate, and our propitiation. I bet you don't know exactly what that second word means. Maybe some of you like, that have taken online the theology courses, maybe you have, but you, know, or you used to listen to R.C. Sproul on the radio or whatever. But, but, and that's great if you know. But if you don't know, buckle up. We're going we're gonna to learn what that means, okay? Let's jump right into 1 John chapter 2. I'll read along out loud, and you follow along silently. It says, My little children. <clears throat> I'm going to stop. I can't stop too many more times, but I'm going to stop. You remember what I told you? Church history tells us the, that when John, the one whom Jesus loved, a church father, instrumental in seeing the first churches planted alongside uh, Peter, when John got too old to do anything else, church history says that he was living in Ephesus, and they would, they would take him from church meeting, from house to house, and he'd gotten too old to really say much that, so he would simply say, he'd say, little children, love one another. And he was too old to walk, and he'd, they'd take him to another meeting, and, and he would just, you know, you'd think like, ah, he's an old man, he's, he's babbling, and then you would listen, and you'd, he's saying it again. Little children, love one another. All right, let's do it again. No, uh oh we lost it? All right. You'll get it back whenever you can, right? I'm going to read it to you. I'm sorry we've lost the screen, but we'll get it back here in just a minute. It says this, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the Righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly, the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Amen. All right, let me review for you the major heresy that was going on in the church. The perp, the, it's to this end that uh, John wrote the first the first epistle of John. Um, in the church, there was this heresy going on. People didn't believe that Jesus was really who he claimed to be. They didn't believe he was the Son of God. They didn't believe he was really a man. They just really didn't believe much at all, and so they had left the church. And so John writes to, um, to really confront this heresy. And if you remember, I said this last week, it's interesting. It's interesting that the symptom, the result of not believing in the humanity of Jesus, the reality of Jesus, the, the, the result is 
a disregard for people. You don't go to church anymore. You don't care about people. You just live for yourself. And so John writes this letter to fight against this false teaching. And by the way, we're going to reread the passage here in a minute. So, so don't worry too much about the fact that you didn't see it the first time. In fact, we've come to that moment in my, my, in my, uh, trend, my, my manuscript anyway. So let's take a closer look now, verse by verse. Look, what is, G, what is, J, uh, what is uh, John saying? He's making some bold claims about, about Jesus, about the church, about you about our sin, about walking in darkness and walking in light. So let's look at it. Let's go back to verse 1. The first, the first claim that he makes, he says, my little children. What is he doing? He's, he's acknowledging his authority, certainly, but he's also practicing endearment. You know, when we were gone during COVID and I was preaching online, and we still put it out online, there's still some people watching at home online, when we were doing that, I had this sense of, like a daddy misses his children, I had this sense of endearment, this sense of wanting to see you. And that's what's going on here. He's saying, my little children, not in a way that's patronizing, not in a way that's insulting. It's this, it's this endearment. And, and, but, but there's another implication, and what would that be? Another implication in this is, hey, he says to his children, we're like a family. That, that's another implication of just those first two words. He's saying, we, the church, I'm writing you, you're like my children. We are like a family. There's some real, com, some real similarities. And then there's a second thing that he says. He says, hey, I want you to avoid sin. You see, he says, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. Now, the problem is, uh, the problem is, you know from the last two weeks of, of studying the first chapter of John, that we know that he's already told us, he says, everyone sins. It was real clear in chapter 1. John says, everyone sins. John says, if, if a person says he is without sin, he's lying, and he's making God out to be a liar. You know what I think he means by that? I think he means Jesus never would have gone to the cross if you weren't a sinner. For you, to, for you to claim that you're sinless, for you to claim that you're all that, for you to, to, to claim that you know, in your legalism that you're, you're okay, like you're making Jesus a mockery of the fact that Jesus went to the cross because we're not okay, because we're, we're not sinless. And so for me to say I am, it's, it's saying that Jesus, you were a liar when you went to the cross. That was unnecessary. It's always been interesting to me from when I was just a little bitty boy going to church, I got this. I had a, I had a fairly high sense of, of logic and a high sense of ethics, even as a little boy. And, and I, I was always intrigued by the fact that in the church, uh, we have categories of sin. Sin that's less bad, sin that's more bad, and usually the sins that are less bad are the sins that I'm willing to admit, and the sins that are more bad are the sins that I know about, you know, like I know your secrets. And, and it, in, in the Bible, it simply says that we've all fallen short of the glory of God. That's what it means. The, the fact that we are sinners, we have all fallen short of the standard, which is the glory, the holiness, the righteousness of God. And so the Bible doesn't major on the different categories of sin in a ranking sort of a way. The Bible simply majors on the fact that we're all sinners. We're all broken. The next thing that John points out in verse 2, he says, he says, but, but if, and really we know that what he means is, but when, but when we sin, because we all do, he's told us that, but when we sin, we have, we have two things. He says, we, when we sin, we have, number one, an advocate with the Father, and that advocate is, I love this title, Jesus Christ the Righteous. 
And that is translated exactly the way it's said. There's not a better translation than, than, than that one from the original language. It says, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He says, we have an advocate, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And then we have a second thing, that he, Jesus, is the, and here's the other big word, the propitiation for our sins. All right, now, we're going to talk about that. Go to the next two slides. I want us to see these two words. One is, he's our advocate, and then go to the next one. He is our propitiation. Now go back to the advocate. We're going to talk about these. Jesus is your advocate, and Jesus is your propitiation. The, the, the first one, advocate. I don't have enough time to really, really do this justice, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you just a little bit. He is our advocate. Do you know, do you know that usually, usually in the Bible, this word advocate actually refers to the Holy Spirit? The original word is paraclete, not parakeet, but paraclete. It's a helper, a, 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 an advocate, someone who is on your side, someone, someone who maybe you have to go before the judge, and, and, and the advocate, he advocates for you. You know, he, you, you go before the judge, and maybe you're not... Um, prepared, maybe you don't know the legalese, maybe you don't know how to represent yourself, but an advocate, advocate comes with you and he represents you. And so usually that word, parakletos, it usually references the Holy Spirit. But here, in a unique fashion, John uses it to describe Jesus as our helper, as our advocate. Now, how does he do that? How does Jesus, how is he our advocate? Like right now, today, at 1140 on, in, in July, whatever day it is. How does he do that? Well, we know from the, from the book of Romans that, that Jesus, right now, at this very moment, is at the right hand of the Father interceding for you. That means he's praying for you. I believe that means, in a very practical way, that, that Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, and he's saying, he's saying, Father, Randy's having a tough time, but I died for his sins. Let's, 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 let's finish what we started. What we, what we began in Pastor Randy, let's, let's finish what we started. And for every one of you, the book of Romans and the book of Hebrews tells us that Jesus, he is interceding for you, praying for you at the right hand of the Father at this very moment in time. He's your advocate. He is your helper. He is your intercessor. But then the second word, propitiation. Now, <clears throat> This word is actually, uh, it, it, it's somewhat debated. I want to show you the next word, elasmos. Um, I'm, I'm going to geek out a little bit, but it's for a purpose. I try never to geek out just for the sake of geeking out. But I want to, I want to geek out theologically because I think this is really, really helpful. Okay, in the bottom is the actual Koine Greek, which I don't expect you to know what those letters are. But then in, the, in, our, in our alphabet, it's elasmos. Now, I put that up here because while the, the, the ESV interprets that word to, to be propitiation, and I'm going to tell you what that means, there are other translations and there are other scholars that, that translate that word um, either as um, expiation, I'll tell you what that means, or a third option would be sin offering. Let me tell you what those mean. And you can decide what you think. I'm going to tell you what I think just based on my study of scriptures. But this word is saying that Jesus is your elasmos. Now, well, it, it, it could mean propitiation, which is an old school word, which means that, 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 that Jesus, he has, he has uh, placated the wrath of God. That the wrath of God towards sin and sinners, that Jesus on the cross absorbed that, and therefore, it's all done. That's propitiation. The, the second word, and some people, they don't, they, don't, they don't really like to major on the wrath of God 
and they, they, don't, they don't think that, that they feel like that's maybe um, barbaric. So, so then the second way of, of, of another, another way of interpreting the word, uh, some scholars would say that it means expiation, which, which means like if you have all your sins on a blackboard and they're all there and it's just ugly, maybe it's a whiteboard, yeah, but, but then you used, you know, black ink to write all of your sins, and then what Jesus does is he comes and he erases it all, he wipes it clean, and that would be expiation. And then the third way is sort of like in between those two, and that would be a sin offering. Uh, that, that this word could be, could be interpreted sin offering, which means that Jesus, um, like in the Old Testament, people would come and they would bring a lamb, and they would slaughter the lamb, and then that would pay the penalty, I believe symbolically really, for their sins, and in that way Jesus is our, like the lamb who was slain, our sin offering. Now, I want you to know that I believe that this word is most accurately interpreted as, as, as propitiation. And I want to tell you why. Um, we talk all of the time about the fact that we are saved, that in Jesus we find salvation. And I would ask you, and I don't want to put you on a spot, and you're not supposed to answer out loud anyway, but if you're using that language, what has he saved you from? What has Jesus saved you from? When we use the word in the English language, we use save. You know, we might say that, like, like man, I was, the, the fighter was saved by the bell, which means that he was about to get knocked out, or he was on the ground on the canvas. He, he was out for the count, but because the, the end of the round came, the bell rang. It saved him, and he could, he could get up and get some doctor's help, and he could fight another round. He was saved by the bell. Or you could say, I, I, was, I was lost. I was out at sea. Uh, I was running out of fresh water, and the Coast Guard came and saved me. You know, or you could say, you know, I was my, my, <clears throat> my financial records were just a mess, but you came in and, and, and straightened it all out and you saved my finances. We use the word a lot of different ways, but what it always implies is that there is some clear and present danger from which we need saving. And it's undeniable, folks, if you've read the Old Testament, if you've read the New Testament, if you've read the Bible, that, that, that there is this picture of God's righteous anger, his, his wrath toward sin, toward unrighteousness, but also toward sinners and the unrighteous. I think we've got Romans which says, and it's a pretty, pretty famous passage, you've seen this, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. In God in his, God in his holiness, God in his righteousness, he, he has this wrath stored up. Eventually it intended for sin and for sinners. We have another passage, 1 Thessalonians 1.10, which says, Jesus delivers us from the wrath to come. They're having a good time in there. That wall just... <laughs> Jesus delivers us from the wrath to come. So, the means by which we are saved, we either, either propitiation that Jesus absorbed God's wrath, and now we're, we are clean, we are forgiven, we are made righteous. Or another way of looking at it, which is not untrue, that he wipes the slate clean, or this sin offering. I tend to land in this camp of it being propitiation, because I think that that was Jesus' speech. I've got some examples of how Jesus, uh, I, I stole this phrase from from R.C. Sproul, Jesus always spoke or often spoke in crisis theology. Crisis, in, in, in Greek, crisis means, um, means judgment. I mean, it's the same word. Jesus often spoke in judgment 
or crisis theology. Think about it. I, I've got some examples, uh, in, especially in the book of Matthew. I've got some examples somewhere. In the book of Matthew, Jesus says things like, I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of the judgment. This crisis theology, that's Matthew 5. In Matthew 12, Jesus says, I say to you that for every idle word men speak, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment. And then Matthew 12, a few verses later, he says, The men of Nineveh, they will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented. The point being, if we don't repent, ultimately what we have in our future is, is judgment. And, and so I'm going to get off this in a minute because the, the main point actually is that Jesus has already dealt with our sin. That, that, that Jesus, he is our propitiation. But I think it is important for us as a church to realize uh, that, that Jesus went to the cross, this brutal, this brutal massacre of Jesus. He went to the cross that, that it makes sense that there is a reason for the, the brutality of how Jesus was treated. And that is he absorbed all of God's wrath, his anger towards sin that we might not have to. He's your advocate. He's your propitiation. Jesus has dealt with all of your sin. Ultimately, Jesus died to save us from the wrath of God. So, so there's, there is no wrath for those who've been saved. Jesus dealt with it on the cross. So, Religion, religion says, I can save myself. I can be good. I can, I can try hard. I can quit doing the bad stuff, and I can start doing the good stuff. I can save myself, and we have a word for that. Uh, it's a phrase, and that is self-righteous. You can make yourself righteous. But the gospel, that's religion. The gospel, on the other hand, says this. Jesus came and saved me. I didn't get to God with, 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 with the stuff that I, I didn't placate God with, with all my good works. Jesus came to me. All right. Review so far is this. Sin has already been dealt with. We do not have to live like, like some people do, saying that we're sinless, that we're self-righteous. No, instead we should confess our sins because we have an advocate because we have a propitiation. And the goal is this. We, the goal is fellowship with, with, with the Father, fellowship with each other, friendship with God, friendship with one another. The means, that means the method of how we get there is Jesus working on our behalf. Not, not us working on our behalf, Jesus working on our behalf as our advocate, as our propitiation, and, the, and then the result, and here's where we're gonna, we're gonna wrap this up. Here's where we're, we're, we're going. The, the result is, what happens now? What do I look like now that I'm a believer we walk in obedience. We walk in the light. Okay, going on. Let's go back to the, let's go back to the, the, you can go, you can just keep going to the next scripture. There you go. All right. A few more points, and we're going to wrap this up. The next point is this. Is there any sort of evidence that we should be looking for in our lives that would say, yeah, I'm a child of God. Yeah, I walk in the light. Like propitiation, what Jesus did, it's covered me. I'm saved. I'm, 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 I'm a child of the living God. And what is the evidence? And we have it in verse 3. Verse 3 says, And by this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. Let's go on. Whoever says, go on, whoever says, I know him, I know Jesus, we're tight, we run, we, we run together. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Again, with the liar talk, we've seen that all three weeks. And then verse 6, we'll come back to verse 5. But verse 6, verse 6 says, whoever says he abides in him, in Jesus, ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. 
So, so evidence that we are in fellowship with God is that we live lives in obedience to the will of the Father. Said another way, in, in verse 6, it says that we abide in Jesus means that we walk as he walked. So, so, so the other side of that coin is if, if you're not walking in light, if, if you're walking in darkness, if you're walking in disobedience, um, that's not the problem. That's just the result. That's just evidence that what? That, that you've never been saved. That, that you're, you're not a child of God. That he's not your advocate. That he's not your propitiation. That you've never responded in faith to Jesus Christ. Now, the, the, the best news of all is, is my next point. If we can make sure we have verse 5. I skipped this a minute. But whoever, whoever keeps his word, Jesus' word, like, like whatever Jesus said, like you do that. In him, truly, the love of God is perfected. The love of God is perfected. Will you say that phrase with me? It's the love of God is perfected. Let's say that together. The love of God is perfected. Can we do that one more time just a little bit louder? The love of God is perfected. I want us to just dwell on that for a moment. What it's saying is that, that, that in your life, if you walk in the light, if you keep the words of Jesus over the course of your life, what is happening is God is perfecting love in your life. Now, this could mean one of two things. This could either mean subjectively or objectively. It could mean, it could mean uh, objectively that like your love for God, like your love, it's, it's, it's okay, and God's going to make your love even better and better and better. But I don't think that would, that's what it means. I think it's actually a subjective meaning to this, which, which says that, that the God's love is in you, and he's perfecting it. He's working it out. It's, it's getting better and better. More of your old, old kind of love is getting rooted out, and more of God's love, his love, is making its way into your heart. So, in conclusion, for the believer, that's you if you've submitted your life to Christ. For the believer, according to John, there, there is this, this two-fold aspect to who we are. There is the ethic of who we are, which means like what we believe, you could say, I believe that Jesus is my advocate. I believe that Jesus is my propitiation. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that Jesus lived a sinless life. I believe that Jesus went to the cross precisely like this brutal death that doesn't make sense except for this, this idea that, that he went there to absorb God's wrath so that I'm, I'm, I'm off the hook. I'm, 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 I'm free. I'm, I'm forgiven. And I, I believe that Jesus did that. And I believe that he, he, he was buried. And I believe that he reanimated himself. He came back to, to life from death, and I believe that he is now living on high at the right hand of the Father. We can say, I believe all that, and that's part of what it means to be a Christ follower. But there's this other side to it, and that is not just the belief, the ethic, but the lifestyle to who we are, which is a result of what Jesus has done. It's not that lifestyle that saves us, but it's the lifestyle that's the result that says, aha, evidence that Christ has saved me. What we believe and, and how we live out what we believe, they are inseparable. Let me say that again. What we believe and how we live out what we believe, they're inseparable. An, eth an ethical life involves our beliefs, but an ethical life also involves our lifestyle. We walk in the light, we obey, we confess our sins, we don't do as others do and just whitewash or cover up our sin. No. Fellowship with God is so important to us that we, we run to the cross. We, we are in a hurry to confess our sins. And Jesus is faithful and true, and he forgives us our sins. Now, a question that you if, you, if you're a really conscientious person, the question you might ask is this, Pastor Randy, am I walking in darkness? Like, you know, some of my life looks pretty, pretty cleaned up, and some of my life looks pretty jacked up. And like, am I? Am I and, I and I would say, in in love, like I, I, I can't answer that question for you. But what I can tell you is where we're headed in the next few weeks. I can tell you, just give, give you a little, 
little picture of what Jesus says about walking in darkness. This is several chapters later. But, but Jesus, when he talks about walking in darkness, he, he speaks of two things. And they're, it's really uncomfortable. I was, I was praying this morning about these two matters in my own life, but two things. He says, number one, walking in darkness. Number one, if you say you walk in the light, but you hate darkness, your brother, or your sister, or your, your neighbor, your co-worker. So if, you, if you say you walk in the light, but you hate someone, you're actually stumbling around in darkness. That's what John, the writer, that's what he's going to say several chapters later. That's one, that's one way of walking in darkness. You say you walk in the light, but you hate you hate people, you hate someone, you're struggling to, like, you're just treating someone terrible, you, you, you just, there's somebody that you'd just rather die, and, and he says, listen, man, I, I gotta tell you this, like, if you say you walk in darkness, but you hate your brother, you're actually stumbling in darkness. Second thing, and we're gonna, we're gonna unpack these in a few weeks, I'm just gonna give you a little picture. Second thing that, that John says, a couple chapters later, is if you, if you love the world, you know, the the fleshly desires, the, the eye candy of the world, and the, the pride and the pompous way that everyone else gets to live. And you're like, I want to be like that, you know? I want to tell people off. I want to be proud and arrogant and flaunt my ways. John says, if you love the world, all, that's, all that goes, he says, then you're actually walking in darkness. Those are the two main, I've read the whole book, those are the two main examples that John says, this is what it means to walk in darkness. Let me give you the final review, and we're going we're gonna to pray, and we're going to run to the table of communion where we, where we can celebrate Jesus' propitiation. Here's the final review. It's kind of long, but I thought it would be good if you saw it. It goes like this. Sin has already been dealt with. We do not have to live like some do, saying that we're sinless, saying that we're self-righteous. No, no, instead we, we should confess our sins because we, we have an advocate. Christ is the propitiation for our sin. And now, with love perfected in us, perfected in us, we're able to walk in the light, walk in obedience, confess our sins, walk in the manner in which Jesus walked. We can now do that. We didn't, used to, we, didn't, we didn't stand a chance. We used to hold our breath for a while, and then we'd go on a binge. And then we'd hold our breath for a while, we'd be good for a while, and we'd go on another binge. But, but in Christ, we now have the ability to do that, to walk in light because of what Christ has done for us. And so God intends to, to grow his love, to mature his love, to perfect his love in you. And if you want that, if you want that, then I invite you. I invite all of us. If, if you want that, I invite you to, to come to Jesus, to, to come to Jesus.